Hello, I'm Frank Wright. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. In this election year, we have occasionally departed from our normal program to bring you specials we have produced on critically important issues. We will do that again this week as we take a special look at socialism. In this election year, we have seen one of the major party presidential candidates running as an avowed socialist, with polls showing a significant number of young people seemingly embracing his socialistic rhetoric and ideology. Declared all but dead just a few decades ago, socialism is gaining ground in America, but it's premised upon lies. What are some of the biggest? Find out on this special program. As a country becomes more socialist, it becomes more secular. Government must become your god. You've got a lot of college campuses where there are more Marxists than there are capitalists. I was a socialist right up to getting a job. Socialism is not a good idea. I don't think it's worth anywhere in the, in the world. Just as socialism is withering on the vine in the rest of the world, unaccountably it is growing in popularity here in the United States. One of the major reasons for its growth is that Americans, especially younger ones, are ignorant about what socialism actually is. Socialism is a political ideology founded upon lies. And on this program, we are going to debunk three of the biggest. Later in this program, you will meet a woman who fully embraced the common lies of socialism and found herself virtually driven to destitution by them. We will introduce you to a man who grew up in the home of one of America's most famous socialists and who discovered firsthand the intellectual poverty of its false promises. Also, you will see how some of socialism's commonly reported success stories really are not. To begin, we look at socialism's biggest lie. Behind the fallacious economic and political system of socialism stands an unabashed ideology that proclaims there is no God. Russian Communist leader Vladimir Lenin, when he founded the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, ordered 70,000 churches to be destroyed and thousands of priests to be killed. A year after Lenin's death, the Soviets founded the LMG, the League of Militant Godless, to completely eradicate Christianity. Wherever socialism goes, especially in its violent form of communism, the Church of Jesus Christ is virtually always enemy number one. But the faith managed to survive and outlive the Soviet Union. El movimiento revolucionario en cualquier rincón de la tierra. Cuba also chose socialism, communism over God-given liberty. Like many Cubans, Rafael Cruz, the father of Ted, initially had high hopes for Castro, only to be sorely disappointed. In Fidel Castro's Cuba, also they began attacking freedom of religion. For example, soldiers would come into a kindergarten class and they would say to the kids, all right kids, close your eyes and pray to God for candy. Where's the candy? No candy. All right, close your eyes again and pray to Fidel for candy. And while the Kids had their eyes closed very quietly. Those soldiers would place candy on all the desks. Communism requires that you destroy the concept of God because government must become your God. And soon came the notorious Cuban death squads to eliminate many dissenters. But of course, the influence of atheistic communism was not confined to Cuba or Russia. I was raised as a red diaper baby. My mother was Madeleine Murray O'Hare. People know her as being an atheist, 
But the reality is, is that at her core, she was a Marxist, a utopianist. Uh, and as a result of that, she tr attempted to defect uh, to the Soviet Union in, the in 1960. That failed, but that led to the removal of prayer and Bible reading from the schools because it was in after that failed attempt that putting me back in school, she discovered the prayer. I was a socialist right up to getting a job. My mother had difficulty holding down a job, um, and I think that led to some degree her socialism. She thought that, that, that uh, having a job should be a right, that somebody should give her a job because of her superior intellect and, and, and education, and that should be it. But she had a personality type that caused her to be fired every 30 days. Atheists see all of this first as being totally subjective and going on only in your little heads. Nowhere else. And secondly, we see it basically as simply being silly. We don't hate you. We think you're quite odd. The case to remove prayer from public schools was brought in my name by my mother. Uh, she did not let go of that Marxism until she started to make money off of the free enterprise system of selling her magazines and books. Despite his upbringing as an atheist, William J. Murray, the plaintiff in one of the key cases against school prayer, later became a staunch Christian, as well as a believer in capitalism and a critic of socialism. It's against human nature, it's against the laws of God, it's against how we were created by God. So your only solution then is to take it by force and if they won't surrender then to kill them. Critics may ask, but what about more genteel forms of socialism that don't kill an unwilling populace to force its way, such as European socialism? Where does belief in God fit in a nation committed to that form of socialism? Well, historically, it certainly seems to be that um, as a country becomes more socialist, it becomes more secular. The end result is the government increasingly takes the place of God. The government becomes God, and that's idolatry. Socialism never is able to maintain stability where the, the, the evangelical gospel has, uh, has, has very solid foundations and, and public presence. So there's no accident that socialism in its European experiment came really in the aftermath of a secularization that took place. And critics note, we've begun to see this trend in America as well. As secularism replaces faith in America, we become less free and more socialistic. In other words, the government is controlling more things and things are controlled from the top down rather than the bottom up. That hasn't worked any time in history. It always results in some form of tyranny. And while you think it would unite people, what it does when you begin to force uniformity, uh, you create division. God is, does not equal government. Government is not God. God doesn't equal government. What I see in socialism is I see people trying to make government God. Or some would say, the nanny state, they'll take care of you. Genesis 1.28 is our economic manifesto. It, 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 it's our understanding of our purpose in life. Go multiply, be fruitful, fill the earth, take dominion over the earth. And, uh, and that, that's what we're called to do. Socialism says, no, we are the dominion. And uh, there's such a direct conflict there. You, you just are, are, are looking at a conflict of worldviews that's massive. In order to take root, Socialism has to take God and biblical principles out of the equation. Instead, covetousness, the desire to have someone else's belongings, is enshrined into public policy. Materialism, the idea that only the physical is real and significant, makes money and possessions the central motivator in life. And with all of this comes a false view of human nature, which says that humans are basically good, allowing a privileged few to set themselves up as the arbiters of who gets what from whom. Ultimately, this leads us to a bait and switch worthy of the carnival con artist, which is socialism's second big lie. You can get something for nothing. 
in the Bible, you've got several economic principles. You've, you've got the fact that we are to, to honor labor. We are to match labor with reward. We are to honor investment. Jesus himself, and even in the parable, spoke about that. We're to honor thrift. Uh, and we are to honor the institutions of society, such as the integrity of marriage and the family, that lead to human flourishing and economic flourishing for all. So there are some very basic principles there. Socialism violates one of the most basic rules, which is you can't steal from someone else, which reminds me of, uh, of one of my uh, heroes, actually a heroine in this case, Margaret Thatcher, yes. who said famously that the problem with socialism is that sooner or later you run out of somebody else's money to spend. A primary example is the so-called Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. The desire is we want more people to have health care. Who doesn't? The problem, of course, is that essentially what Obamacare did is it promised far more people broader health care coverage. And what happens with that? Well, that means that there's a greater demand for health care services, which means spending goes up, prices go up. And then the question is, well, what do you do about that? Well, you have to give massive subsidies to people because you're driving up the price of health insurance because you're mandating more procedures. And then, of course, you have to mandate that everybody buy a policy because it's more expensive. So you just you keep seeing these new complications. The root of the problem is that decreeing free health care does not result in more doctors, hospitals, or medicines. It merely increases the demand on the quantities of those things already there. The president promised you like your policy, you keep it. Not at all the case. Lots of people lost them. Lots of people are paying a lot more. Insurance companies are complaining because people game the system. That is, I don't sign up unless I'm sick. So Obamacare faces extraordinary challenges. Put it on my desk. Well, I think we have a president who really believes in the power of big government. I think he is ideologically uh, driven by growing government. He sees the government as a vehicle to redistribute income from rich to poor. I think that if you look at everything that's happened, Obamacare, all of the bailouts, the stimulus plan that was really meant to take money from the rich and give it to the poor, a Robin Hood type of strategy, that's never worked. I mean, we in America believe uh, in, a, in an aspirational society that through growth and through hard work and through pulling people up by their own bootstraps, that's how you get ahead in America, not through a handout from the government or a government program. But I think the president really believes that government is where wealth comes from rather than private businesses and private entrepreneurs. I think a lot of the youth are being um, lured into this idea that socialism is a good idea for two reasons. One, they've heard through the conditioning of the, the school apparatus that social justice is a, a value, a virtue that we should aspire to. That means redistribution, taking from one to give to the other. They don't know that this is actually inconsistent with scripture and never will work. It's, it's, it's rooted in covetousness. You know, now we go and hire politicians to go and take from somebody. But another problem is they have bought this idea of materialism. They actually think that uh, uh, very selfishly and individually that somebody should help them. Somebody should make sure that they cover their wage, to cover their tuitions, to cover for, and then they'll try to blame, well, what about the poor? And these are the ones that have been uh, just confused. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that I believe that the body of Christ needs to step in and re-educate their own children. The problem with government overreach and replacing the church is that they are replacing then a, a real significant part of mankind, a need, a vacuum uh, that we all have to reach and find God. Star Parker, the founder and president of CURE, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, knows firsthand the dehumanizing effect of living independence on the government. I look into my own life and my own testimony and how after believing the lies of the left for years, you know, that my problems were somebody else's fault, that America was racist, I shouldn't mainstream, that, that poor people were poor because wealthy people were wealthy. And in buying all of that worldview, I got really lost and ended up in aggressive living, criminal activity, drug activity, sexual activity, in and out of abortion clinic after clinic, in and out of welfare after welfare. I did not have to personally think about my health decisions because the fact that the government was paying 100% of any and every decision that I made. If I got pregnant, they paid for that. If I got abortion, they paid for that. If I wanted birth control pills, they paid for that. If I got, and when I got STDs, I had everything from syphilis, gonorrhea, to you name it, they paid for that. So if you have an environment that says, we will pay for anything and we're not asking anything back from you, your life will spiral out of control. 
And it wasn't until a Christian conversion I was able to change my life. You remove that opportunity for people and they stay lost. And that's one of the problems. When government tries to replace God, people get lost. As a nation, we're built on freedom and personal responsibility. You can't do that outside of having uh, uh, core principles and a rule of law which are rooted in a worldview. And that biblical worldview is where we were founded and it's where we should stay. A house built on a faulty foundation will not long stand. And socialism rests upon the shakiest foundation of all, falsehoods, fabrications, and fictions. First, it argues either explicitly or implicitly that there is no God. Second, it makes the empty deceitful promise of something for nothing. But third, one of the ways socialism has been able to gain growing acceptance, especially among the uninformed and gullible here in America, is through the fraudulent claim that socialism actually works. Why, just look at the nations like Sweden and Denmark, they tell us, and many accept those claims at face value. But Dr. Nima Sanandaji of Sweden knows better. He holds a PhD from the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden and is president of the European Center for Entrepreneurship and Policy Reform. He is also the author of Debunking Utopia, Exposing the Myth of Nordic Socialism. Many on the left in America, the left politically, hold up Nordic style socialism as an ideal for American political economy as well. You have written that that's at best an apples and oranges comparison. How is Nordic socialism different than what's being advocated here in America? In not only the US, but globally, the idea of socialism was almost dead until the left started saying, you know what? We don't want socialism like North Korea, Venezuela, Soviet Union, all of these miserable failures. No, no, no. We want Nordic style socialism. And suddenly they started to have a case. But as I show, the Nordic success story is about a unique culture and it relies on, you know what? Free markets. Mm. Socialism has not been successful in Nordic countries, and by large, Nordic countries have spent 30 years moving away from socialism. I think young people in America, if they were to hear you speak and read your book, might be surprised at what getting the thing they're asking for, democratic socialism, would bring them. Uh, loss of freedom, yeah. loss of opportunity, destruction of incentives, destruction of your own your work ethic. You know, I think that uh, to understand it, you have to just read about the tens of millions of people socialism has killed. Mm. And I, I'm, a, I'm a moderate guy. I don't exaggerate, but it is. I mean, that's the numbers. But really, I think understand their ideas. People don't understand ideas of socialism. What is the goal of socialism? It is to break down the individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's a, the goal of Marxism, not, not just consumers, that's a goal. Break down the individual, break down the family, break down capitalism, and break down every institution of the social society, and civil society, and replace, replace it, it with state. One column, the state. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much. Debunking Utopia. My pleasure. A great book. I hope it's widely read and you receive much success here in America. Thank you so much. Thank you. When we stop to really examine Nordic socialism, we see that it is not, in fact, the socialistic success story often portrayed. The parts of the Nordic economies that actually work are not socialism. And the parts that are socialism don't, in fact, work at all. A look around the world shows us that socialism stifles initiative and innovation wherever it goes with a predictable outcome measured in shortages and human suffering. To my knowledge, there is no place on earth where socialism has been successful in any kind of a long-term way. Capitalist economies have outperformed socialist economies in terms of alleviating poverty uh, in the 20th century, in the 21st century, like no century before. 
Uh, we've had sort of a worldwide laboratory experiment. China has actually turned to capitalism on a very local level to help the people of that country uh, raise themselves up and feed themselves. They have eliminated thousands, hundreds of thousands of times the poverty since they went to a modified capitalist system than they ever did or ever would have under a socialist system. But many bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. are convinced that it is government, ultimately, that somehow produces wealth. I found from being in Congress for all these years that the reason for the division in Washington, the reason that one side always wants to spend and raise taxes, is they really believe that the government drives the economy and, and that if you grow the government, you're going to have a better economy. But you don't have to look far to see where that ends up. That's where Europe is today, particularly Greece and some of these other countries. That's where Detroit is. The people in Detroit today still vote for the same policies that have created the, the hole they're in. And if you want an, a modern example of why socialism doesn't work and what it produces, look at Venezuela. One of the richest countries in the world, Venezuela is in the midst of a crisis. In addition to the second highest murder rate in the world, Venezuela has the worst inflation in the world. And since 2012, the currency has lost 99% of its value. Everywhere, there are long lines for food and necessities. There is a shortage of food in this rich country that has some of the world's greatest oil reserves on the planet. The situation in Venezuela gets worse every day. I can't stand it anymore. All I do is stand in line. I just went and couldn't even get a ration of flour for bread. What's the purpose? To make everyone depend upon the state. That is the strategy of communism. For people to depend on the government for even a morsel of food. Era comunista. From 1998 until his death in March 2013, Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez launched a socialist revolution to redistribute wealth, confiscate property, nationalize companies, and take over the media. The government has closed down private enterprises, and unemployment has increased, which has caused a chain reaction of delinquency and lack of security. I no longer work as an attorney for various reasons, but mainly because justice no longer exists here in Venezuela. The socialist policies have caused a complete social and economic collapse with dangerous shortages of every kind. It is an extravagance to get sick. Here people easily end up in the hospital and the hardships they endure to get basics like a syringe or a vial are terrible, not to mention supplies for surgery. But for the privileged, supplies miraculously appear and in great quantities. Ironically, the wealthiest person in Venezuela is the daughter of Hugo Chavez. All the promises of socialism in Venezuela have turned out to be lies, bringing destitution, suffering, and death to the population and increasing power to those in control. Obviously, the Bible is against the communist model. They have tried to equate themselves with the one true God, hoping to become an idol. God does not share his glory with anyone. And when an entire country calls a man sovereign, all-powerful, that he's my commander and I'll do whatever you say, you are taking the place that belongs only to God. Jesus tells us that no bad tree bears good fruit. And history, human experience, and the Word of God make it abundantly clear Socialism is a bad tree, rotten to its very roots. To this day, it impoverishes people in Venezuela and Cuba. And contrary to the conventional wisdom of the politically naive, Nordic nations are fleeing from it as socialism begins to corrode their work ethic and national dignity. Yet here in America, a major presidential candidate can earn significant support by declaring himself a socialist and captivating the uninformed with the fallacious rhetoric of a demonstrably failed ideology. Only by believing socialism's lies is such a thing possible. This extraordinary election year 
demonstrates that we may only be one more election cycle away from an avowed socialist actually gaining a major party presidential nomination. Friends, we need your help to continue producing and airing programs like this one to get the word out on socialism as well as other pressing issues of our culture. Do you know someone who might be susceptible to socialism's three big lies? Get a copy of this program for your children or grandchildren or perhaps a college student you know. These lies are becoming pervasive in our culture and they need to be exposed by the searchlight of biblical truth. Please give a generous donation to help us produce and air important programs like this and we will send you a DVD copy of this program, Three Big Lies of Socialism, including special bonus material as our thanks. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 888-332-3069, or go online to djkm.org. When you go to socialist places, you see that very few people work. Everybody thinks it's wonderful, you're going to get all these free things. But, you know, at some point, you've got all the people in the wagon and nobody's there to pull it anymore. All these advantages of Nordic society that Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Bernie Sanders believes America will get by adopting Nordic style socialism is not what's going to happen. Well, socialism is not a good idea. I don't think it's worked anywhere in the, in the world. You can go to any inner city in this country and see what happens when government controls health care because it's 100% controlled by the government and it's 100% a disaster. History shows us that once socialism's lies have taken hold in a political system, it is very difficult to weed out as its tentacles choke out everything that stands in opposition to it. America's free enterprise system is not perfect by any means. We Christians need to embrace the biblical admonitions and commands to take care of the least among us. But it is certainly worth noting that everything from the iPhone to Google to Amazon.com, along with stunning advances in medical technologies and medicines, all can be traced to free market economies. At the same time, the corridors and galleries of tribute to socialist innovation are cold, dark, and empty. Freedom leads to human flourishing, while overweening government that takes from some and redistributes to others leads to stagnation, shortages, and ultimately misery. Our freedom benefits the entire world, and we must stand to uphold it while we still have the light to do so. Thank you for joining us for this special program. May God bless you and may God bless America. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.